Good morning. Well, it's uh, really an honor to be here with you all. Uh, I have been really honored to be doing this work for the last uh, almost 14 years in um, the area, having moved out here from New York. I trained in New York City. Any of you work, train, or live in New York City professionally? Couple hands, all right. Yes, Dr. Newman and some others, okay. So, um, you know, there we like to say, if you train there, you see everything. And I, I thought that was true, and then I moved to the Bay Area. <laughs> now I've really seen everything, um, almost, I guess. But, uh, you know, every, every uh, we like to say in school mental health and in crisis management that every sentinel event is an opportunity to learn. And we certainly have been privileged to do that within Palo Alto Unified School District and some of the other places where um, my team is involved. So I have about 25 minutes, and I'm going to run through some overview points that will hopefully set the stage for the panel discussion that's going to follow and then question and answer. And we always like to say that school work and school mental health is really village work, which you all engage in. It takes a village to do all this work. So we're really eager to tap into the collective wisdom that you all have in your experience with some of the points that I'm gonna raise. <clears throat> I'm gonna divide this part into roughly four sections. First, I'll provide a general overview of why we do school mental health and why we care so much about delivering mental health in schools where the kids are. I'm gonna talk a bit about suicide risk and suicide prevention. Many of you know that, particularly in the South Bay, we've had a number of losses of our young people, not only teenagers in schools, but also young adults, transition age youth. We had a suicide cluster in Palo Alto in the 2009-2010 window. We've learned a lot from that experience, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some evidence-based programs that we've been implementing and also doing research on. I'm gonna highlight one called Sources of Strength, which is an evidence-based program it's in the slides. We may not go through all the slides, but you will get access to the slides at the end of this, and there are a number of resources. And then finally, we'll conclude with a concept called developmental assets. Do any of you know that framework? Okay, a few of you know developmental assets. It's another big place that we're focusing energy and resources in terms of prevention. I'm also gonna say a little bit about social media, since that's the other place where our youth are living, in addition to the schools and um, hopefully I can finish on time and I will trust my um, timekeeper here to help me. So I call it culturally adapted school um, risk prevention because we live in a United Nations of cultures, as all of you know if you're uh, working in the Bay Area. Um, so a lot of my work is focused on cultural adaptation, a lot of this work. Um, the first um, uh, disclosure I have around grant supports from the U.S. Department of Education. We're doing a trauma-focused group treatment in San Francisco Unified where we have had to make a number of cultural adaptations. Um, the Packard Foundation and a number of other foundations support our work. So I hope by the end of our time you'll be able to describe some essential features of one of the theories that came out of our lab and my lab's work um, called the Supporting Alliance in mental health, I'll explain a little bit about what that is. Uh, talk about risk and protective factors for youth mental health crises, cultural issues specifically as it relates to prevention, and suicide prevention specifically, some recent digital media trends, some effective strategies around adult advisor, peer leader partnerships, and then we'll talk about barriers. I think I'm gonna leave that to the discussion. But those of you working in this area who have lots of good ideas, who'd like to go forward and implement things, you know there are often nuances within a system that keeps people stuck. So we'd like to talk about ways to get unstuck. I'd like to thank uh, Congresswoman Speer, who I've known for many years, Alana Paul, who I've known for about four weeks, who's been really helpful in organizing this, Linda Lenoir, who's been my partner for so many years in the uh, Palo Alto Unified School District, who's with us today as the district nurse, Victor Ojakian, former mayor of Palo Alto and chair of the um, uh, Suicide Prevention Oversight Committee and the Mental Health Board. I'm gonna put up a number of resources that you will have access to in the slides, but I wanted to call attention to these um, four organizations in particular, also to set the stage of what we're gonna talk about during the panel. 
Um, some of the terms you will hear are things like psychological first aid, mental health first aid. Um, you'll also hear a number of um, references to these organizations, particularly NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. So I wanted to start with this because um, my son looks a lot like this kid. Uh, this is from my colleague um, from the Stanford Sleep Center, Rafael Pelayo, who, um, ha this slide comes right from him. Half of teens, this is from 2011, and it's getting worse. Half of teens in the US say they send, read, or receive text messages every night, or almost every night, in the hour before bed. And 9%, actually he thinks this is way underestimated here, report being awakened after they go to bed every night, or almost every night, by a phone call, text, or email, and uh, almost 20% say this happens regularly. Now, how many of you are parents of teenagers or have raised teenagers? Okay. How many of you once were teenagers? <laughs> Times have changed a little, right? So part of the reason to put this up here is in school mental health, we're talking a lot not only about school, but school as a context. They spend you know, 35, 40 hours a week in school, but then they spend this time at home. Sleep is something that joins us all across cultures, across social demographics, and it's an important piece of what can lead students down a road where stress becomes unmanageable and desperation starts to sink in. So it's a very important conceptual issue that I'll um, refer to a little more in the discussion. I want to start with this concept. This is a conceptual frame for the next 20 minutes. It's called the Supporting Alliance. And I'd love to say I was the author, but it actually was one of my graduate students, and um, he's at the University of Wisconsin now. And he developed this when he was doing his dissertation. He was interested in how do parents of children with autism engage with science to get the best information about how to get resources for their kids. And so he was interested in uh, then, well, any chronic illness, particularly a chronic mental health condition, poses lots of problems for parents and for teachers and administrators. You want to support a teen, a student in your school, and you're just not sure either because of uh, whether or not they have public or private insurance. Sometimes they have better access when they're not privately insured. So he was interested, and what we came up with was the idea that these groups of trusted adults, parents, teachers, school staff, a list administrators, uh, parole officers, and um, certainly um, uh, police and other community uh, professionals are part of this, and then doctors and therapists. And we do an okay job talking with one another, and uh, what we need to do is focus not so much on what works well, um, but we need to focus on this group right here, because peers are really where students are getting the majority of their information. And this model sort of assumes that parents will talk to doctors and therapists at some level, especially in the beginning, and parents will talk to teachers. But in my group, we're really focused on trying to get teachers and doctors or community um, police professionals, POs and other folks, other trusted adults in a high-risk teen's life to be connecting more with the doctors and the therapists. And there are actually some treatments that have looked at that that some of you may be familiar with. But most of our kids are actually getting their mental health services in school. If you think of the 80-20 rule, you know, 80% of our kids are doing pretty much okay or doing fine or excellent. 20% at any time in the US will fulfill criteria for a psychiatric disorder or severe mental health problem. And probably 10% of those are severely affected by having limited access to the curriculum because of their mental health condition. Schools are first-line providers by default. It would be much better if it was by design. And that's what a lot of communities around here are really trying to focus on, by creating either a school mental health team at the school site or embedding it within school clinics or having a partnership with the county or a university. So among children who do receive services, 70, 75% are saying school is a primary source, 25% are getting treat in the general medical sector, and there's one um, uh, particular stat I want to reemphasize, which is that almost 10% are not progressing academically due to a mental health condition. In collaborative treatment, we're always really trying to um, empower the village. 
school administrators, doctors, school psychs, therapists, and other trusted adults all have different ways of looking at problems. And effective collaboration will then utilize all these resources to generate a much greater amount of collaboration. How many of you are familiar with the concept of multisystemic therapy? So multisystemic therapy, here's when I invite you to look up mstservices.com. This has now become a very robust evidence-based treatment for the highest risk youth. These are juvenile offenders or those who've already, um, either those who've, who've had uh, multiple trips to juvenile hall or those who are on their way. It's basically, as the term implies, a way to get to empower the village to work together with very specific roles, time-limited, manualized focus treatment across the different systems in a teen's life. Okay, now I'm going to move a bit into teen depression because that's what I do the most of in terms of um, thinking about prevention. Um, we're doing a lot of this work in primary care, but it also is a nice platform and is currently being studied to think more about violence prevention. And we use a leadership model, a peer leadership model, that I'm gonna talk about and I'm gonna present a little bit of data and then I'm gonna move through for the last 10 minutes in the interest of time to resilience. So here's a scale. Here's a picture that looks very familiar to everybody. We're always balancing risks and assets vulnerabilities and protective factors. This slide comes from my colleague Francis Wren, who's at Stanford, and we have this community, school, family, and teen and peer sphere. This slide comes from um, a colleague at Berkeley, Michael Riera. Michael Riera's uh, we website and books are referenced at the end of my talk. If you look at the left side, you can see on the x-axis, now this got, shrinked, this got shrunk for this uh, presentation, but on the x-axis, because you just see on the left side, some common stressors for kids. And on the y-axis is like degree of stress. So girlfriend, boyfriend rejection probably comes first and foremost, right? That's where your stress goes up into the buffer zone. What do you do in the buffer zone if you're a teen? You text a friend, you talk to a trusted adult, maybe you talk to a parent or someone else in your community, maybe you do something hopefully healthy to help you deal with it, relax, and then your stress can come down. Exams, life transitions, this is a big one, which I hope we'll get to talk to a little more, speak about a little more in the uh, panel. Graduation. Now, when you think about kids having agency and control over things in their life, what happens when they don't have control over these things that are already stressful, but into the buffer zone, they can reach out for connections. And when there's background stress via traumatic events, whether it be divorce or parental strife, death of a loved one, anniversary of someone who died by suicide or someone who was killed in a violent manner or died from a chronic illness, financial stress, poverty, other factors that the teen doesn't have control over, what you see is on the left now looks more stressful and goes beyond the stress tolerance level and that's the place where desperation starts to sink in. And that's often the place where the primary care provider might call us to get involved. If you think about depression, again, 80% of kids who have experienced a traumatic event are not going to develop post-traumatic symptoms or PTSD. But the 20% who are vulnerable, it's really just the wrong combination, whether it's PTSD or depression or other things that you all see in your work. Just the wrong combination of genetics, life experience, and their brain. That's the background. And then you take, you, you factor in ideas like emotional regulation. Teens get upset all the time. Parents get upset, but you're hopefully able to bounce back, right? That's the concept of resilience. But for teens, how intensely and how long and how quickly can they bounce back to their baseline? Do they have some capacity of, for joy and humor? How easily worried or fearful are they? After an event like Newtown or after an event like what happened in, um, in San Mateo with the, with the pipe bomb, you see that these kids are more vigilant, they may not develop PTSD, but they may develop what we call PTSS, which is post-traumatic stress symptoms. What kind of, what, how is their sleep pattern being affected? That's sort of one of the first signs that something might be going on. And finally, cognitive style. How flexible are they? How much agency do they have for their own safety, for their own sense of being accomplished and appreciated? We still drive home the point that schools are the safest place for our kids. Whenever we do a parent talk, we first sort of normalize the idea that this is a high stress time, we understand that, but I would really want to have my son 
and I have three sons, and I'm always full of self-disclosure. School is where I'd want my, my uh, kids to be. <clears throat> in, if we're thinking now about specifically about major depression, which is a risk factor both for crises in general, but especially for suicide, but also for, for violence. A lot of the kids who've been identified as having a history of, say, conduct disorder or conduct problems often have an, another condition, such as depression, underneath. Average age of onset, about 15 years, so roughly sophomore year. In teens, we see a much higher prevalence than in children, but 6% of the population, think about it. Think about it in your own schools for how many kids that is. Two to one ratio of females to males once you hit adolescence. And generally in our field, it's apples and trees. One don't fall far from the other. So when we're trying to create a sense of urgency with teens when we're doing presentations or teaching in classrooms, we say, look, how many of you know someone who's been so stressed that the usual coping measures weren't working and they had to talk to someone? How many of you have known someone like that or someone who actually was formally diagnosed? Everyone raises their hand. And then we say, by the time you walk across the stage and get your diploma, 15% of you will have had major depressive disorder, like major depression, the medical illness, and up to a quarter of you will have had depression of some type by the time you're 18. That's a kind of a compelling statistic, as is the family statistic, which those who have depression in their families know about that. But that's important for, for us in our work, for us in this room, because sometimes it's hard to know if this is depression or not, or if there's a propensity for violence, but if we know a little something about the family history, it can make all the difference. So here's some work from Lynn Ponton, very quickly. We believe risk is important and essential for adolescent growth. Those of you who've raised teens know this is true. But positive risk is elusive. Teens take risks to shape their identity, to fit in, and they're particularly drawn by popular culture. So we have to pay attention to what they are watching, where they're surfing, and who they're hanging out with. It can take many forms. And so particularly we see with young children um, some of the clues about their patterns of risk taking from cautious to middle of the road to high end. And if it's accelerated in one area more than others, problems can increase, particularly if it coalesces in groups. Healthy risks in general can evolve into healthy behaviors or resilience, but sometimes they can evolve into more dangerous behavior. So these slides are from Gloria Moskowitz Suite. I have her website up here. If any of you are interested, she will come to your school and do a, an amazing uh, parent training. I just um, was in two sessions with her at one of our high schools. Um, it's a very provocative picture. Where it looks like he's pointing something like a gun at you, and this is the video camera. This is the new playground. This is where kids are hanging out. Now when they post things, they have a much bigger audience with a much bigger stage. So we have to be paying attention. We have to know what's normal, what's not, how do we know when to worry. How am I doing for time? She's holding up a sign, 10 minutes, okay. So this is from the uh, YRBS, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. They just released the results from 2010, 2011, and so more than 15,000 students. <clears throat> and the risk factors that are highlighted here for youth suicide are almost exactly the same, and then there are a few more for violence, but I wanted to highlight these because this is based on 15 years of data now in the field. And if I'm just gonna run through it very quickly. So we talked a little bit about genetics and not much about the brain today, but we did say that there's some combination. It's not simply environmental. There has to be brain vulnerability to be impulsive enough to carry out an act you might just be thinking about in your head or you might have seen about. We've certainly seen that media reporting or media non-reporting, as the case may be, uh, can be helpful or not helpful, or I'd say not helpful or helpful, as the case goes. Um, we've certainly seen that with, in the case of death by suicide, when it's reported on page three, four, or five without a screaming headline, with some information about what happened, matter of fact, no pictures associated, but with some resources, that's much more helpful, I know I'm singing to the choir here, than screaming headlines. Screaming headlines are particularly problematic for vulnerable populations. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple here, particularly around prior suicide attempts, psychopathology, which we'll talk a little more about on the panel, sexual orientation or um, sexual issues, sexual minority youth coming to terms with who you are, boy or girl, who you're attracted to. 
And then the personal characteristics and biology really at the end of the day kind of set the stage for what you have in your classroom, what you have in your community. Um, if we think about our community in 2009, we had five teens die by suicide at the train tracks at one particular crossing. The um, epidemiology of suicide in the US is about six per 100,000 deaths per year. In that 18 month period, we had five deaths by train, which was a, about a 20 fold increase in epidemiology. Now, I'm happy to say, I'm pleased to say, we've not had any deaths by suicide since all of our community coalitions came together, but we have had a number of deaths of young adults, the 18 to 25s, the folks that might have been around during those deaths and now are aging out and now are kind of in the gap. And that's, that's a particularly vulnerable population that we'll talk more about on the panel. Okay, now in the interest of time, let me move to protective factors and then we'll stop and move to the panel. So some of this is very intuitive, but it's nice to know that there's research to show it works. Um, family connectedness, parent-child relationships with just the right amount of parental involvement, enough but not too much. In some of your communities, you face one problem or another. Some of your communities, you have parents who are helicopter parents and way more involved than you'd like them to be and in other communities, you wish you had helicopter parents, right? But through a variety of cultural reasons, whether it is two parents work and if they have to come to a meeting, it means loss of wages. If their documentation status is in question and they don't want to create any problems, they, they may not want to draw attention to themselves. We may have a more difficult time being able to engage them. Um, again, sorry for the slide. I think just when it got compacted and went from Mac to PC, we lost some of the, um, some of the spellings here. But pro-social peer connections and the perceived availability of trusted adults which is even more important than the actual availability. If they just know there's someone that they can talk with, they may not actually go, but they know that if they needed something for themselves or for a friend, they'd know where to go, particularly on a school campus. So here's a concept of developmental assets in a nutshell. This was created by the place called the Search Institute, and there are 40 developmental assets, which are basically the positive values, relationships, and experiences that youth need to thrive. This has been normed across social demographics from the most at risk and underserved to the most privileged. And what they've come up with after about a million, 100,000 um, student uh, um, data points, youth with low asset up levels are more likely to engage in the risky behaviors that we all deal with. With higher asset levels are more likely to choose healthy activities. Now in Palo Alto we have 41, and the 41st asset is cultural self-identity, and we believe that every kid and family comes from a culture. It may be defined by race and ethnicity, but that's usually not the whole picture. Every kid has a culture, and every family has a subculture, and we have to engage in that to understand more about how they might access help or not. <clears throat> so here, just really briefly, this came from the data set a couple years ago, looking at Palo Alto youth, comparing them to Santa Clara youth. This is about 2,700 kids. And I just want to highlight, on the left, here's the risk-taking behavior. And if you look down here on the bottom, let's focus on these two, depression and attempted suicide. Here's a percentage of the total sample, and here's the number of assets that were endorsed based on some questions that were asked. If you look at depression, as defined by feeling sad or depressed more or all of the time in the last month, 13% of the total sample endorsed that. That's about the same as that first slide I showed. Remember that, where 10 to 15% will have had depression of some type in their life before they graduate? But look, those with less number of assets, fewer number of assets, 24%, 17% of the sample, if you had 20 or less, are more likely to get depression. Whereas if you have 30 or more, 20 or more, 7%, only 2% of the sample, if you have 30, 30 assets or more. Attempting suicide, very similar picture. So what is the assets approach? It makes the shift from focusing solely on problems, assigning blame, feeling like there's no hope, and primarily relying on professionals only to moving to a focus on strengths with youth as resources, where everyone has a role, and it gives you a sense of hope. Now the data are pretty robust in this area, not only in our community, but also nationally. In our community from our data set, again, if you look at fewer number of assets, 
40% of the sample uh, there if, they're, if they're have, uh, have used alcohol if they had zero to 10 assets, okay? Compared to only less than probably 3% of the sample if you have 31 to 40 assets. Same thing here with attempting suicide and skipping school. The fewer number of assets you have, the higher your risk. The more assets, the less your risk. And then this is just looked at in an opposite way. If you look at um, healthy behaviors and things that we really want to empower in our kids, whether it's helping others, delaying gratification, um, succeeding in school, et cetera, assets decline as kids get older. And so we have this window of time especially in middle school. High school, it's not too late, but we really have to make our interventions if we can in elementary and middle school. So this is grade level, fifth grade, seventh grade, ninth grade, eleventh grade, and you can see the average number of assets per grade level going down. These are some examples of developmental assets. So, for example, one is called Community Values Youth, and these are examples are leadership groups, Youth Leadership Recognition Night, Teen Center Evaluations. My colleague, Linda Lemoir, has been very involved with specific activities that maybe we can talk about during panel. Positive cultural identity, self-esteem, family communication. These are some examples, and you'll have access to the slides. There's some very specific activities that my kid's principal, the two principals, send home to me as a parent. Here is an example of developmental asset that we're working on this week, thank you. Here are some things you can do at home and in your community to live this asset out. So they make it very concrete in the community to, to make it palpable and so people can just practice this. So again, back to this slide. I wanna to move to sources of strength and then I'll stop. So sources of strength, which is now being studied, this is a suicide prevention intervention, very robust, published in the American Journal of Public Health and I have the reference in the slides. We are now conducting this in Palo Alto and at St. Ignatius College Prep in San Francisco. It's now being looked at as a bullying prevention intervention and a violence prevention intervention by increasing the adult peer connections and improving school climate. <clears throat> One of the aims is that peer leaders are empowered to be agents of change with adult partnerships. This is health promotion, suicide prevention, through increasing positive coping norms and now being looked at at violence prevention. And basically the idea is no, why would we do this with teens as change agents? It's because teens do what their friends do, but even more so, it's their belief for what, they, for what their friends are doing. The two often don't match, but the idea that we can sort of change the cultural norm over three to four years is pretty powerful. So peer norms influence all the risk-taking behaviors we're worried about, as well as a lot of the coping behaviors that we'd like to empower. So here's an example. In 2003, 2005 in Georgia, where they only did gatekeeper training, like QPR. How many of you know about QPR? Question, persuade, refer. This is like CPR for kids who might be in a mental health crisis. They got trained in how to ask a teen if they're suicidal, for the warning signs, et cetera, for referral resources. But suicidal teens were actually least likely to go to adults for help, and the adult training alone did not increase communication in this particular study. So sources of strength not only engages the teens, but also the community and trusted adults, both in and out of school, and it involves basically, if this is a high school with peer networks, you identify peer leaders. This is what the school staff does, the faculty does. So here's the football players, there's the students not connected to the school, the theater club, you might have Students with low attendance, you've got some goths on the bottom and maybe the chess club and maybe, you know, another, name your favorite, click. And the idea is you train the peer leaders in a half-day training and you train the adult advisors in a half-day training um, through a number of specific messaging steps to create climate change and culture change. And the ones who really benefited the most were the highest risk kids. And what ended up happening was... This is, again, you can look at this. The effect sizes are very robust. If an effect size is more than 0.3, we say, well, that's a pretty good sign. If it's more than 0.5, it's very robust. So connections to adults, improved school climate, improvement of help-seeking acceptability, and the perception that adults help suicidal peers. And that's why this is such a promising intervention. This is just a comparison of help-seeking norms of peer leaders in control schools at baseline and five months after training 
versus sources of strength schools. And you can see on a scale of one to five that there was a significant um, change there. And same is true for peer leaders feeling like adults are here to help those who are in highest distress. So in conclusion, I just wanna say that things like this that focuses on school norms can help to increase and empower youth who will go from saying, well, I, I don't wanna snitch on my friend to I need to get someone's attention because I'm worried and I might be actually saving a life. And we talk about in Palo Alto very specifically at Palo Alto, at St. Ignatius, at Milpitas High School, many of the high schools that have suffered loss because of suicide that, you know, we have had this experience in the hospital and the clinic where a concerned student told an adult at school that person got help. It was anonymous, but that person got into treatment and in at least three cases we know that we saved a life because of what a student did. The last thing we're doing this year is we're really focusing now with qualitative research using focus groups on particular cultural subgroups. The two most interesting subgroups in our research now, which is true in all of California and on the West Coast, is Asian American teen girls, which have the highest, now, highest growth in rates of depression, and Latina females in the, say, 15 to 24 group. So a lot of our high school, you know, juniors and seniors. Those two particular subpopulations, were, which were not previously considered as high risk, are now really front and center in a lot of the interventions trying to understand what are some cultural barriers that might be getting in the way of engaging them and helping them to, to um, seek help. So my last slide from Michael Riera is, this is what we tell our parents, Teens need to fire us as managers. You move from being a manager to being a consultant. You know, as you move from being like parenting a child to parenting a teen. So my career actually proposes that, well, they need to fire us. That's a developmental step they have to do to take the next step. And they don't often do it with much poise. So we gotta look for openings to connect and discuss, often on the way to school or on the way to practice, because they don't have to look us in the eye, right? You've had your most meaningful conversations when they're in the passenger seat. Being open-minded, letting them explain why they love and use the internet. Ask them to teach you what sites they go to and why they like those. And finally, never losing sight of how important you are to your teen or to your student, even if they cannot acknowledge it. So there are a number of resources there which you can look up. And I'll stop now and I think we'll move to the panel. Thank you.